so we just want to uh, let uh, give everybody an opportunity to check out what our uh, panel, uh, what they talk about uh, before uh, the live button goes on. Our, our live recorded button goes on here on the playbook uh, ATS uh, shows each week. I know Mark uh, was a little bit late for the show today and we had all three analysts hanging out just talking. So uh, we're going to go ahead. Mark, I know you haven't had an opportunity to watch this yet. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look at what uh, Andy, Jim, and Tony had to say before the show began today. I like it. Andy, I think by legalizing sports betting all over the country, the kids are now seeing it, eating it, sleeping it, can taste it. And now they're realizing how much power they have. Yeah, oh, you mean with the uh, the NIL? Well, the, with everything. Or are you talking about the betting public? The just, betting. Uh, just on the bet, just on the yeah. betting. I mean, they 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 see this. It's everywhere. Every newscaster, broadcaster, journalist, and these are 18, 19, 20 year old kids that don't process things completely. And, uh, that's well, that's we, the advantage to some of us because that means there's now more of the quote unquote square public getting involved and sustaining it longer and longer than ever before. Because you have so the many one people thing that coming you, into the market. The one thing that you now have no uh, you know, no mystery on is you know, you used to kind of wonder, well, do do, they, do these players, do these coaches know the spread? Now considering that it's everywhere, you see them on the bottom line, there's no way not to know the spread. Well, especially I, like when they're the, all watching the highlights every night of themselves on TV, absolutely. on Sports Center, and all and <laughs> yeah. such shows. Uh, like a couple of weeks ago was uh, that Bandy Florida cover where Stackhouse pressed the entire last few minutes and Florida couldn't handle it at all. And then they get under the number. I think the number was like uh, 15. They got lost by 14 or 13. And then he stops pressing. Game ends. But I mean, you have to wonder if he's like, all right, well, at least cosmetically it looks better. A lot of these losing coaches have to do that. Well, yesterday, uh, yesterday uh, SIUE wouldn't stop fouling Moorhead. That game got over. It was like at fifty at the break and gets over to gets over one forty. Holy shit! Yeah, really? Third. Well, it, it, the coaches would would sort of wink, wink, nod, nod about the point spread when asked about it. In other words, saying the quote unquote politically correct thing: No, we don't know anything about it even though, of course, they very much did. Now it's hard to not know the point spread because it's all over ESPN yep. at the scroll or when they're talking about a specific game. So it's hard for them not to know pretty much what it is, whether they take advantage of it. Well, we'll find out because, Jim, you mentioned that the UAB Temple game. I understand that they're looking into some unusual betting activity that drove that line up from 2 to 7 yesterday afternoon. It went, it from, uh, it went to 9 before one of my books took it off the board. Mm. Nine from two. Yeah, I didn't see. I don't think I saw any injury, uh, significant injury information. It was. It, it's the play. The players don't like the coach, and they wanted to get him fired. Okay, makes sense. That's what they're. That's what they're now saying. So, true or not, I don't know. Unfortunately, I had no money on that game. On, yeah. it, on it makes sense, but the fact that so, that something is possible doesn't mean that it's probable, likely, or occurred. But it remains possible. And that's the thing that we're always dealing with, with like, especially conspiracy theories. The fact that something's possible doesn't mean there's anything to it, but it remains possible. And as long as it's possible, most people, are, most people that feel that way or think that way are going to believe it till the end of time. Exactly. I guess we're having Mark's having trouble with his the audio. I hope he has a mic plugged in. <laughs> it could be something as simple as that. That is possible. A long shot to win it all. Who we got? Gonzaga. Fine long. You can only pick one. Well, you got 120 to one. Yeah. You have to love Gonzaga. Define define what the odds are to be considered a long shot. Twenty five to one, twenty to over, one, over twenty to one. I'll tell you what a lot of people will do, and I, I including myself, is 
now we wait for Selection Sunday and the matchups because teams now that are 15 to 1, depending upon where they are in the bracket, could be 40 to 1 come uh, Monday after Selection Sunday when they revise all the odds and there are very often some bargains there. And of course, they go up from 15 to 1 to 20 to 1 because now we know the path to the finals. Good point. Excellent point. Did that uh, did that baseball rule uh, to speed up those rules to speed up the game? Did that help any last year? Yeah, from what I, I heard, believe it did. From what I read, by, it, by it, a lot. it did. Yeah, yeah, by a lot. That's sure, cool. They're not, going, they're not going away. A bunch. What was the best one? What was the best rule? Yep. I mean, I don't know. I I didn't mind the pitch clock. That was fine. If, if uh, pitchers, and it usually, usually was relievers, weren't aware of it or got caught by it, it was just a ball. So, yeah, by like the way, Jim, uh, Ken Palm has San Diego State by six. And the numbers that they usually open are very close, within a point more often than not. That's, uh, that's, what not, Ken Palm that's, not, that's not the spread because I just took eight and a half. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm saying that they're they're betting San Diego State maybe because I don't know if they're, I think they're unbeaten at home. They are sixteen and zero. I think I've there's right. five teams that can win can yeah. tie for the Mountain West. Yeah, and these two are two two of them. Um, let me see. I thought San Diego State has one more. I think San Diego State, well, I guess a lot of people would have to lose because I thought that uh, San yeah, Diego I don't, State I don't has think six San conference State losses. Can, yeah, I think it's the UNLV Nevada winner can tie, um, can tie uh, Utah State if New Mexico beats them. And then there's one other team that's in that mix, too. It's not Colorado State and it's not San Diego State. Yes. There we go. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> Not good. Right. I think we were just talking about the best part of the show. We should. We probably should have recorded it. We probably should almost do that as a, well, as a regular I've, type thing. I've been recording the last eight minutes. Well, okay. That's that's a show in itself. <laughs> that's like the uh, NFL Today, the pregame show. All right. Let's see. Yeah, Utah State has four losses. Nevada, Boise, and UNLV have five losses. So. Either Nevada or UNLV will end up with five losses. They could tie Utah State if they lose. San Diego State does have six losses, and New Mexico's pretty much played themselves out of it with a 10-7 and seven record entering their final game. Hi, everybody. Welcome back once again. This is Mark Lawrence, and we're all set to go against the spread on this preliminary March Madness weekend of basketball. I'm going to welcome to our show our co-host, Andy Isco from TheLogicalApproach.com, the living legend himself, Jim Feist, live from Las Vegas, and our good friend, playbook experts, Tony Mejia, as we're all set to go against the spread, looking at this weekend's college basketball conference tournament card. And I also would be remiss if I did mention our producer, Greg De Palma, will also be joining us on the show with his bits and takes about what's going on. Greg's a big college basketball fan as well. And, guys, as we start the show here this week, uh, let's sort of set the table if we can. I can feel it in the air, March Madness. It's in the air right now with uh, these college basketball conference tournaments going on. And uh, let's sort of set the table, if we will. And uh, I want to remind our listeners out there that if you like what we're doing, please click on the like button down below. Or if you have any questions or comments, we've got the answer. Simply click on the comment button. And by all means, please hit the subscribe button, if you will. So with that... I'm going to turn it over to Andy Isco for our first question of the day this weekend on the podcast here. Andy, it's March Madness Conference tournament time. What are the first things you're looking at when you're handicapping these college basketball conference tournaments? I look at the conference standings of the teams in each conference and where they're seated. 
And normally, let's use an eight-team conference or where you get down to quarterfinals, one versus eight, two versus seven, etc. What I look for are conferences where there may be a significant gap between, say, seeds one through four and five through eight, or where there are conferences where there's a lot of con congestion. And like we were talking about it before we started the, the uh, show, the Mountain West Conference, where you've got five or actually, I think, seven teams entering this weekend all within three games of the conference lead. So you're talking about effectively the top seven teams not separated by all that much that often make some very good plays on underdogs when you get two of those seven seeds matched up. Now in the Mountain West Conference, I think it's what, about a 10 or 11 team conference. So it'll happen after the uh, first couple of rounds where you get the, the play-in games and all that. I think the top five teams in the conference uh, get by, so the, the bottom six will play. So I look for situations like that or where there's a significant amount of, of a gap between how these teams performed in the conference that very often some of the smaller favorites, say, in a um, four versus five matchup where there's a significant difference. And because you're four versus five, you're generally going to see a competitive line in most situations. I'll look for situations there where the favorite is, uh, uh, is, is small priced. Of course, you're always uh, you're always confronted, or not always. You're often confronted with the situation of a team playing its third game against an opponent that it faced both at home or on the and on the road. So you played both venues during the season, and the age-old question, and you apply in football as well as basketball: if the series is two and zero, oh, does the team complete the sweep for the third game, or does the team seeking to avenge those two losses get revenge? And then at the same time, the point spread is involved. Because some people will say, well, the teams lost the uh, first two regular season meetings. Now they can basically save their season by beating the team they couldn't beat earlier. And then the other opposing view is, well, if the team was good enough to win the first two games, they're probably good enough to win the third game because now it's the most important game of their season in order to keep their season alive. So those are some of the factors that I look at before getting into the individual matchups of the games that I'm going to be uh, deciding upon. Jim, let me ask you this question. Uh, Andy brought out some great points about what to look for when you're handicapping these college basketball conference tournament cards. How do you look at past history about performance from certain teams? And as an example, I'm going to throw out there the Kansas Jayhawks, who have literally dominated the Big 12 Conference, as we know. Uh, but suddenly, they're not going to be the number one seed, and suddenly they're not going to be the choice in the conference do you look to make a case for teams like Kansas who have been there and done that before, or do you backpedal and recognize the fact that they're not up to par this particular season? Well, the, the, I could, I could say the same thing about Gonzaga and St. Mary's where yes. Gonzaga normally would be the number one team. And generally speaking, they deserve to be this year at St. Mary's. And so it really depends on the roster. The, the coaching if the coaches haven't changed and they have experience at being in these tournaments and doing reasonably well I will I will look at that but if the roster has changed too dramatically like for Kansas themselves they're just not as deep as they have been in the past and and Bill self is always a good coach and so is fry up at, uh, at Gonzaga these guys they know how to win but when you look at the, the big, I mean, the coach, the, the um, it's a two-team race in, in, you know, with St. Mary's and Gonzaga. But when you look at the, the uh, Big 12, that is one hell of a conference with a lot of really, really good teams and good coaches. The talent depth there is absolutely amazing. It's very difficult to say for sure who's even going to come out of that. I don't think Kansas will survive it. I don't think they're as deep. I don't think they have had the season. They don't have the, and then when you look at, you, you look at other teams at Baylor who was down to Texas the other night, and you would think after how they've been doing, you thought, well, maybe they'd come out flat. And the they didn't. Then they came back strong. I mean, this is, you got to look at all these facts. There's nothing easy about this. And we were talking before we went on the air if you took the top 30 or so teams in Ken Palm, which is a very popular site that people use, and could you say that there's anybody that's absolutely out of it in that top 30? Or is if you went 35 or 40 deep, is there anybody 
between 30 and 40 that has absolutely no chance. This, the way basketball is played today, a lot of teams don't bother to play defense, a la Kentucky. But they have such offense that you almost have to score 90 to 100 points just to stay with them. So it's a different kind of a game than it used to be. So I really look at the coaching as, as the key factor for me. If the coach has reasonable talent and depth, and he's had talent and, and he's had success in the past, he's going to be my choice in most cases. By, by the way, you mentioned uh, the West Coast, Gonzaga, St. Mary's. Two things, and they're sort of related to one another. Gonzaga, at most books right now that I've checked, and i checked about half a dozen or so, Gonzaga right now is a minus 120 to minus 125 favorite to win the conference tournament, even though they're their number two seed. St. Mary's is actually priced as a slight underdog of about plus 115. Now, the thing that's related to that is the West Coast Conference rewards regular season play. So that whereas a team, for example, like uh, Pepperdine, who uh, won uh, on uh, Thursday afternoon by a bunch of points against uh, Pacific, they have to win, I think, four games to win the tournament. St. Mary's and Gonzaga each only have to win two games because they get pass, they get double buys into the semifinals. So yeah, they a are going to be rested, and b they only have to win two games, and that's why you see such dramatic odds shift in that conference. I believe, I'm th there may be one or two other conferences that also reward these by for their regular season performance by getting them into the uh, semifinal round. But I know that the uh, West Coast has been doing that for quite a number of years. Tony, Jim brings out a good point about the, the college basketball teams, the head coaches, which is where I always look first. Uh, you yourself, as a handicapper, I know you use a lot of a, a lot of good arsenal, and in particular things like the net rankings. Uh, how much of those do you use when you're looking at this conference tournament here this year, as opposed to what you felt about these teams before the season began? Well, I'll tell you what. If I don't know the teams as well. Uh, because I, I do try to stream everybody at least once or twice, have action on a game, and see, oh, is this guy worth anything? Is this team worth anything? So you look at their their profiles going into a game. Um, you know, for instance, uh, SIU Edwardsville played uh, in, in their, their first round game and uh, really took control of that game against, I believe it was Eastern Illinois. Um, and that was strictly, although I, I looked to see who exactly, uh, you know, the particulars were in terms of, where they stand among the conference leaders in, in rebounding and scoring and whatnot. It's a team profile. So what's what's your pace like? What's your defensive efficiency number? And then you pair those. If I know if I know you a little better, if I've seen you eight, ten times, then it becomes a styles make fights thing that I referenced last last week. So for instance, I have a big play in the Missouri Valley game between Belmont and Northern Iowa. I won't tell you who I like because it's a fair to <laughs> The clients that might uh, that might purchase a play, but I like it enough that that's I play of the day, and uh, you know it, that is entirely okay. I like this team a lot much more a lot more than this particular team, and that that's kind of like how I project uh, a, a, a a tournament champion. What is the bracket look like? Uh, as as uh, Andy mentioned, now a lot of these these uh, conferences have wisened up and rewarded uh, regular seasons and give you a double buy, double buys in the Big Ten, double buys in the ACC now, whereas before it was, all right, you, you play, you know, this amount of teams make the tournament and it's one, eight, uh, two, seven, three, six, four, five, and there's really no advantage because everybody plays the same amount of games. Now everybody gets in and uh, you have teams waiting on the, the bottom feeders to kind of get to them, see who survives, and then you you capitalize on their tired legs. So, I mean, look, uh, this is basically what what my week looks like. It's just constant numbers and matchups and whatnot. And this is, I mean, it's all things that make sense to me. And then you you combine that with what the bracket actually looks like. So for Sporting News this week, I, I, I wrote about the Sun Belt. I wrote about uh, the, the uh, SOCON and I wrote about uh, the Coastal. So CAA tips off. Um, and that, that's a really interesting conference because UNC Wilmington has lost in the championship game twice in a row. Uh, will they break through a third time? Appalachian State has had their number each time this season. And, and, and to reference that, you know, do you, do you have a situation where Appalachian State is just a better matchup than anybody else for UNC Dub? And they're going to beat them a third time. 
Or do you say, well, this is this is the, finally the opportunity for UNC Wilmington, especially since they're led by a couple of seniors that are really good, uh, that are starving to finally get to the NCAA tournament. Um, will, will that be the deciding factor in, get, in getting them to break through, considering that the CAA is going to be a one bid league, even though uh, both the Mountaineers and Seahawks are are really solid teams that would probably do well if they make the NCAA tournament, but there's only room for one given what we see on the bubble this season. So, um, you know, I, I just kind of project to, to get there and hopefully we do get those matchups. We talked a lot last week about the Horizon League, Mark, and how wide open that would be. My projected champion in that Youngstown State, they bit the dust yesterday. I think somebody like Wright State here, they're done too. So, um, you know, in, 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 in that sense, you kind of look at that and, and project chaos. And I think we did that last week. I think we said if there's going to be a topsy-turvy tournament, it's probably going to be the Horizon League. It was indeed just that. In fact, uh, I'll share with our listeners out there that uh, one of my favorite handicapping ploys when these tournament begins is what occurred in the uh, in the Wright State Northern Kentucky basketball game last night, and it's a right back revenge rematch where the two teams that met to end the season also open up the conference tournament. And you'd be really surprised to see how that guy that just took the loss, how he bounces back with a vengeance in that first basketball meeting in the tournament, which is exactly what Northern Kentucky did. Greg, let me ask you this. Uh, we have some of these conferences that are getting bigger and bigger and better and better, uh, largely because of the expansion, uh, the Big 12s, uh, so forth. What about the little guys, the smaller conferences that are shrinking like a violet, like Conference USA? Uh, you've got a new newbie in the conference, uh, Sam Houston, who looks like they may, may well be the team to beat. How do you factor in that, Greg, the, these conferences? They're probably soon to be extinct, but there's going to be a winner, and that winner is going to be in the NCAA basketball tournament. What do you look at them as going into the tournament as a team that survived out of a, a, a small, smaller sample, if you will, of a conference like the Conference USA, or is Sam Houston just that good? Uh, well, first thing I would do is, as a matter of fact, I even have it uh, uh, up right now, and I could probably, um, you know, I'm going to do this because I think it's really good timing. Let's do this. I'm going to share this with everybody on uh, as we move along here. So I go to, and I'm sure you guys use this site too. I mean, I use it just because it's real quick, and I can quickly go and use for stats and schedules. So I use the, the Sports Reference College Basketball site. So let's say um, I, I'm, I'm, as I'm surfing here, let's see, we're going to go over Conference USA. There's Sam Houston. So I'm going to click Sam Houston. And the first thing I do is if I'm doing research on them, this is just me, a couple of things. But the most important thing, I want to look at their schedule. So I'll pop up their schedule here. And then I got to take a look and find out, OK, especially if they made a move to another conference. And we talked about this last week with football. Uh, what does their schedule look like? Is it still, uh, they're still playing a lot of teams from uh, the week conference that we were formerly in. It's got to take time before they get a full schedule. And I can see here, you know, they got a full conference uh, USA slate of games. And outside the conference, I see that they lost to a good Grand Canyon team. Uh, they got blown out by Texas Tech. Uh, they got blown out by Arizona State. Uh, and they lost only by three to, uh, to Ole Miss. Um, and that was their best loss. But they, so they don't really have any good wins. They don't have, I mean, that's the best loss they have. So that's really, my point is, and I just wanted to share that with everybody just so you could see what I do. Uh, the point is, is that, um, I, yeah, I think you have to look at those first because sometimes you could see a team could be even 15 and one in a conference. And if they make a move from one conference to the other, uh, we saw that in football this year. We've seen it in college, as you mentioned, with a team like that. But um, that's the most important thing that I look at is um, I'm only focused on what's going on this year. Uh, what's the schedule look like? How do they look like they're competing not only in uh, non-conference games, but also in the conference? Um, and then most importantly, maybe is the fact that they're red hot. And maybe that's part of the reason that you're talking about them right now, because uh, it looks like they've won uh, six out of seven and uh, maybe 10 out of the last 11. Greg De Palma, producer of the show from Prime Sports Network, joining us on the podcast here today. And let's go backwards from where we started. Tony, I'm going to throw this back to you, this question. And it's basically uh, concerned with this is Tony, who also not only is a playbook expert, but as you mentioned, he's a contributing writer to the Sporting News, which is a publication that I lived and died with as a kid. I mean, I used to save all of my Sporting News. There was a time I had every 
one that was, I think the fire department, the marshals come over and say, hey, you got to get rid of all the papers. <laughs> They're going to be a fire hazard. But uh, Tony does some really nice work for them. Check them out at sportingnews.com, uh, if you will. But Tony, a question here I have is this, is uh, everybody loves everybody loves an underdog, and a lot of these underdogs come from the mid-majors, the guys that are going to knock the big boys off. And you look they get to be pretty popular, these uh, smaller mid-major conferences. Then you begin b making cases or choices for some mid-majors to maybe have two teams represent the conference rather than one. Uh, is there any mid-major here that uh, you could see, uh, I'm talking lower rung mid-major, uh, that could you know, possibly send two teams to the tournament. We're looking at, uh, obviously, St. Mary's Gonzaga, both have credentials here, but anybody else that might be a surprise, like in the Mid-American Mid Conference, I don't see any two teams, and all you have to do is look at their play this year in the uh, Quad 1 games. Every team in the Mid-American Conference that's played a Quad 1 team, they're 1 in 31 combined. I don't see anybody – two teams coming out of a conference like this. Is there anybody that you might see as a surprise that comes out of a mid-major conference that people weren't expecting? Yeah, it's definitely a down year for the Mac. I mean, you had guys like Ray J. Dennis transfer to Baylor. It seems like they they lost all their top tier players to bigger schools. And that's just a casualty of the transfer portal. Uh, and the Mac are certainly pay, paying the price. Akron and, and Toledo lead that league. And absolutely, they that's a one bid league. Uh, Missouri Valley, maybe. I mean, uh, uh, Indiana State advanced today. Uh, Drake is a, a popular choice for everybody, and, and that's a, a league that plays really well. Bradley's got a nice uh, RPI um, and uh, or, or a net rating. That's what plays the RPI. Um, but you know, so, so you got you got those two. Um, if if uh, Cornell or Yale wins the Ivy League, Princeton has some support as a uh, as a potential at large. Um, you know, so that would that'll be interesting to see what happens there. We talked about the American and South Florida nation's longest winning streak. Uh, right now, they're climbing because their 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 net ranking isn't what it should be because they really didn't play many teams uh, as far as quad ones. But at the same time, you can't deny they're a conference a regular season champion. Can't deny they're, they're if they lose in the tournament, they'll still be nine and one over their last ten. Uh, and uh, it, I think they'll definitely get some support. And if you if you lose if you see South Florida losing in their in the AC tournament, it'll probably be to Memphis or Florida Atlantic, who both have solid credentials. So the AAC might be a two bid league. The Atlantic Ten technically a mid major. Um, you know, right now you have to tip your hat to what Richmond was able to do as a as a projected uh, as, as a regular season champion because they wrapped that up. Dayton, if they beat Houston, right? uh, I think the Flyers have a good shot at an at large. That could be a two bid league. But uh, I mean. At this point, a lot of these teams are going to be rooting against the ACC squads. You've got Clemson playing a big game this weekend uh, against, I believe it's Wake Forest. And then Pitt is there as, as a team hoping to get a double bye. Um, and I think if you're an ACC team right now, Clemson's probably in. You know North Carolina and Duke are in. And then you've got everybody else. You've got your Pitt. You've got Syracuse. Um, that, that are probably and Wake Forest was playing themselves uh, losing to Virginia Tech, losing to Georgia Tech on that blown travel call, and then they get on the buzzer beater. So maybe they're destined not to make this tournament. Um, but again, on the outside looking in, uh, and then you've got the the glut in the Mountain West, where you know, increasingly likely that we see five six teams from that that league. So uh, the mid majors and and they're screwed by the NIT, the UNIT rule. I was uh, yesterday years old. When uh, I found out, as I, I completely missed that memo, I made a comment about uh, about EKU losing the A Sun and uh, having an NIT. But somebody corrected me and said, "Oh, you haven't seen the new NIT rule. Now the conference champion of the of the smaller uh, conferences are no longer locks to get in the NIT. They're strictly doing it based on net ranking. That'll make for a stronger tournament. But again, a lot of these teams that the, the, the lesser league conference champions that lose in these conference tournaments." no longer have a spot uh, saved for them. So, um, you know, you, you, you have the good with your bad with that, but it'll make for a stronger NIT. The bottom yeah. line is bub bubble wise, uh, a lot of these mid majors are going to be just one bid leagues. I think uh, maybe the Ivy and potentially the Missouri Valley. You, you talk about uh, the NIT, I think another fact that they talk about the net rankings, I think they talk about arena size. Money always talks, you know that. Yep. 
I mean, we <laughs> talked about that uh, uh, last week uh, regarding uh, South Florida. Remember? We talked about oh, their ranking. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're getting in the top 25 for the first time. And they were getting no respect, though, uh, from the odds makers. They were the dog at Charlotte. And what did they do? They just didn't beat Charlotte. They kicked their ass. And they, they haven't lost in the friggin' two months. And and what if they do go all the way to the championship game without losing and then losing the championship game? Man, they had better get into the tournament. That they would that would be a, a complete... Injustice. Yeah, that, it would be terrible if they run the table all the way to the championship game, lose the championship, lose that game, and don't get in. I mean, that's. Ridiculous. I'll tell you another another mid major, and I think I think actually uh, it was uh, mentioned before by Tony. Um, Sun Belt, James Madison, Appalachian State. Right. Appalachian State has a win over Auburn this year. James Madison was a top twenty five team for a while, and why was that? Because they had draw drew attention in their opening game of the season when they went up and won at Michigan State by uh, uh, you know a, a, a few points, three or four points, and I think that. Sometimes that's what influence, and I know that we're going to talk about uh, like UNLV. Uh, I'm going to talk about them a little bit later, where they have been playing as well. But the point was made. I think I brought it up last week with uh, the Jerry Palm, who's another one of those bracketologists. They have that loss against Air Force, and I've we've sort of alluded to it. A loss like that can keep you out, regardless of the remainder of your body of work, which, by the way, for UNLV included in avenging that 32-point loss at home with a 29-point win when they met Air Force again. I'll talk more about UNLV a little bit later, but uh, that's another thing uh, to keep in mind as far as looking at these, uh, let's call them bid busters. They used to call them bracket buster, that bracket buster Saturday. Bid busters as far as teams that come out of nowhere, and almost you have to give a second team in that conference a bid. Well, we yeah, talked about right it. Right now you have to, you have to root against teams like – St. John, Seton Hall, Ole Miss, the, the, yep. the teams, the Texas A&M, the teams that are on the, the back end of your power conferences are going to get a ton load of teams. Uh, but if they lose two in a row, lose early in the conference tournament, that opens up a spot for one of these mid-majors. But look, look, South Florida, still in the 70s in this net ranking and 1-0 and against quad one teams. If you, if you want to be a committee member that doesn't want to let them in, all you have to say is they only played one quad one team. And Sorry. that's a problem is that, you know, when these teams that play in the Big 12 or the Big 10 or the other power conferences, don't just look at the number of wins over quad one teams. Look at the number of losses they have also because the Big 10, you know, maybe eight of the teams are quad one teams. You take a look at the Missouri Valley, you're not going to have teams that play more than maybe one or two games against quad one teams. So you shouldn't be penalized because the power conferences, and I know they schedule a couple of years or so in advance, but if you've been a reigning power in a conference, Teams of the power conferences are not going to want to schedule you, schedule you because it could result in a quote unquote quad one loss for that team. You know what I miss, uh, and I I didn't notice it lately, but I, I loved, and I think everybody did, that what, what what was it that weekend that they would have at the end of the towards the end of the season like a month, buster. Yes, what happened to that? Mid majors. Yeah, why did that go away? That was perfect. You would schedule as many of these out-of-conference games, which would give teams an opportunity to play out of the conference against a, a, a you know highly uh, ranked uh, team or a team from a power conference. Nah, we don't want to do that because that's just going to give these mid-majors more of an opportunity to, to stake Act their case. Actually, I think what it was was somewhat along those lines, but it used to be, or it, be, uh, it turned into a, a good mid-major would face another good mid-major because those matchups were, were generally not... Uh, right designed until like January and the season was unfolding. What it did, it would give the re the committee a reason to eliminate the loser of a bracket buster game against a fellow team, opening up more at-large bids for the major conferences. Sure. You know, unfortunately, that's the way that it works. It, nothing says things are going to be fair in the college basketball. And any, you know, it's like I always talk about the college football playoffs. And to a certain extent, it's been eradicated. But up until... The, We've just had the last four team format. It's an invitational, just like the NIT has it right. The National Invitational Tournament. It's uh, it, there. There are some objective criterion that are used, but it's also a lot of subjective. You take a look at a team on the bubble. Okay, there are going to be five reasons to pick that team in and five reasons to exclude that team. So when they have the uh, interviews with the selection committee after the uh, selections are announced, and they and the uh, the reporter says, "Well, why did you choose Team A over Team B?" They'll talk about the positive reasons for Team A and the negative reasons for Team B. 
And then when they take a look at Team C and Team D, and they pick Team D over Team C, D had the negative reasons of Team B that was excluded, and Team C had the positive reasons of Team A that was included. So they basically have a, a variety of reasons that they can justify any selection that they want to make. Yes, the objective criteria are a guide, but you know they're, they're guides, but they don't control. You're tuned in to Mark Lawrence against the spread, the nation's most popular sports handicapping talk show. We're talking the college basketball conference tournaments with our group of experts here. And uh, Jim, I'm going to turn this over to you right now and ask you this question. Uh, what, when you're looking at these teams and you're analyzing them statistically, uh, what do you consider the most valuable statistics that you look at? Is it like defensive field goal percentage? Uh, is it rebounding? Is it margin of game? Uh, what's most important to you when it gets to be college basketball conference tournament time? I think it, it goes back to every, just about every sport that I that I handicap, but other than probably baseball, strength of schedule. How many times did they play a tough team, whether you call them a quad one or not? Um, and that's usually how they rank them by that. And And how did they do in those games? Because when it comes down to the tournament, we're talking about the major tournament, the NCAA uh, format. There's a lot of pressure. And these are still 18 to 22 year old kids. And when you have a, a solid coach that knows how to get these kids to do what they need to do at a, at a pressure point, it, it's going to come down to how many times have they been in pressure situations. And when they play tough schedules against tough teams, and they have to shut a player or two down and run a play that it, at that last moment to get that last shot. It's take it's going to take good coaching. It's going to take somebody, a, a player and a coach that's been in situations that have been tough before. And I, I can go back to just the Super Bowl. At the beginning of the year, I bet San Francisco to uh, win the Super Bowl. I had a, a, a ticket on them. But when it came to the Super Bowl, I bet on Kansas City. Now, why would I do something like that? Because, well, first of all, I saw how San Francisco played at the end of the season, which they fell off more dramatically than I thought they would. And Kansas City, because of the great coaching and the great quarterback and Travis and all that, and the offensive line playing well, and the great defensive, what I felt was a great defensive edge with Spagnola. To me, they were the better team. They should not have been the underdog, although there wasn't many points involved in it. It's still, we're going back to what they were looked like in September, which I never thought Kansas City was going to make the Super Bowl because of the flaws that they seemed to have. But the coaching brings it along. And that's that's how years ago, and Izzo's probably more out of the picture now than he used to be because, he, you know, Mr. March, he would come in and do all his magic. But... These coaches that know how to win, a la, you know, Connecticut, somebody like that, that that they know how to win. They know how to coach. They know how to make those plays, those adjustments. The kids know how to handle the pressure. They don't choke. Sometimes it's it's uh, not it's, sometimes it's an advantage to have a few more seniors and juniors than freshmen in spots like that, too. But they play 30 games. And these kids are really locked in to what the coach is telling them. And uh, they've been there before. So it really comes down to strength of schedule and how they've done in situations that require you to do something exceptional in that last moment. And here, Jim, I knew you bet on Kansas City. I thought for sure it was the Taylor Swift factor. Uh, well, well, definitely. That was that was a side bet. I, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> But you do bring out an excellent point, and I, I want to call this to the forefront here about strength of schedule. And when I look at these teams statistically, and I really hone in on them, like the top 10 statistical categories, and see how they rank in amongst each other. And my favorite is defensive field goal percentage, and you know, I love scoring margin. Uh, but if you look at uh, those two categories in particular this year, uh, the number one team in the country in both defensive field goal percentage and scoring margin is McNeese State. Uh, why? Because they don't play in the same neighborhood as the Kansases and the uh, Dukes of the college basketball world. It's the opponent or their strength of schedule that they're putting up all these strong statistics up against. 
they're much, much better against those teams. But the question is, will they be able to, to sustain when they make the big NCAA basketball tournament? And just coincidentally, one other sidebar note about that, the number one team in the country in offensive field goal percentage, guys, was Wright State. It didn't do them any good in that game against Northern Kentucky. Uh, they were just outshot in the basketball game. So I think a lot of when you look at these statistics, you have to take them with a grain of salt and ask yourself, like I said, what neighborhood did they live in? What neighborhood did they play against? Because strength of schedule is all largely dependent upon uh, who you played against and then who you're playing against when it gets to be NCAA tournament time. Mark, I wanted to ask you, where does Houston rank in those two categories? Because I believe for a good part of the season, they were right up there, number one or number two in both of those categories. Houston's number three in defensive field goal percentage and scoring margin. You know, the truth is... And that's, and that's in a major conference. Yes, and that and they're from a Big 12 conference, exactly. UConn's number two, Tennessee's uh, in margin, and Tennessee's number two in defensive field goal percentage. So, uh, you know, they do those up against some good quality opposition, unquestionably. So, you know, they're warranted uh, to be exactly yeah. where they are. Arizona right there in scoring margin as well. And I think if you had, had to ask a coach uh, uh, what, you know, what he wants to see out of his basketball team, he's going to talk about defense first and foremost. But uh, if, if, if you – put a lid on that and said, what else do you want from your team to be able to do the best? And that would be rank high in scoring margin. You know, that's how, how big you win the basketball games. You know, that's how good your basketball team is. And there's a formula that we do in the playbook basketball newsletter uh, that we do. We call it the eight elite elements and it's produced uh, 20 of the last 22 NCAA basketball tournament winners. Well, one of those elite eight elements is scoring margin. You know, uh, they had every team to qualify has to had a minimal scoring margin of, and I don't recall it right now here. I'll know it when we get to, we publish it, but uh, it's important. Uh, and scoring margin also tells a lot about the whole makeup of a basketball team. Greg, what, what do you look at uh, when it comes? I know we're we're kind of pushing the envelope and moving a little bit toward the NCAA tournament, and our focus here is on the college basketball conference tournaments right now. But when it gets to be college basketball conference tournament time. And you have these upstart teams in these tournaments that come in here and they pull that upset in the first round of a game. They pull the rug right out of a team that's uh, obviously seated much, much higher from them. Do you look to continue to play on that team in its next game or is it time to get off the merry-go-round? Uh, you know what? I, I don't really care. Well, a couple of factors I'll look into, and that really goes into stats. And we talk about it when we preview the tournament each year. Matter of fact, we'll do that uh on the 18th, I believe it is, uh, Tony and, uh, and Jim and I, and, and we'll go over, and I already sent Tony like a list of, um, and we did this last year, Mark, where, uh, we'll pick out, okay, uh, what, what, like number seeded teams, uh, have usually advanced statistically at this point during the, during the, uh, tournament. Uh, there's all sorts of different trends that you can look at that, uh, I think is important when you're talking about a bracket. So when we're t and one of them is, um, it's important that you uh, don't lose. I remember one of them is it's important that you don't lose like in the first round of a conference tournament. Uh, I think one of I think it's like no team has ever won a national championship that's done something like that. So I'm more into the stats as far as as opposed to the feel of of a, of a team. But one of the things I definitely look at for sure is mm. experience. And I'll give you a team, for instance, uh, and it's a, it's a, it's a mid-major type team, and that's Colorado State. Now, Colorado State, I think they've had the best wins out of any team in the conference, but they're also, standings-wise, like in the worst shape. But when you look at them, I think the top five or six players on their team are all seniors. And that's mm. the thing I like to look at especially the mid-major teams, because mid-major teams, these guys are around usually for a little bit. Now, I know you got the portal and all that, so sometimes seniors will come from other schools, but a lot of times these guys are together for multiple years. You don't see that a lot in college uh, basketball, especially with the higher programs. So so that's what I like to look at when, when I'm excuse going me, to... Excuse me, Greg, didn't Florida Atlantic have a very similar profile last year when they made it to the Final Four with experience? I, I think they do this year as well, Andy. Yeah. Yeah, they uh, they there were a couple of guys that that they've lost. I think they've lost what one or two guys from that team, but everybody else is back. Uh, but last last year they had, I think, a great deal of experience. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so that's definitely something that I like to look at. And on the flip side, we were talking about coaching. Um, 
everybody wants to talk about, oh, you know, Tom Izzo, coach, and so and so, Bill Self, or who's really good in the tournament. I like to look at also the exact opposite. Like when I see Tennessee at 10 to 1 to win the national championship, the first thing that pops in my mind is, is 10 to 1 with Rick Barnes? I mean, are you crazy? This guy never does. He's, he's the Mr. Underachiever when it comes to uh, tournaments. Why would I even go? Cr- why would I even think of putting money on Tennessee at ten to one with this guy coaching, who's a great coach? I'm not trying to put anything down on Rick Barnes because he's a great coach. It's sort of like comparing Shanahan. Uh, I know Shanahan's a great coach, but he just doesn't win the big game. Barnes, great coach, but he has problems around tournament time, and I just don't know why. He has the hope uh, Dalton Connect can carry him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, let, let me ask you this question then, Greg, uh, in, in that same vein, if you will. Uh, out of my well-oiled machine, my database, you know, I'll plug questions in when tournaments are over and look to see how, as a, for instance, uh, conference champions out of the Southeast Conference fair in the NCAA tournament, what they did, what they do in the first round, how did they get here, so forth and whatnot. And if I told you that SEC champions have – won five of the last 15 NCAA basketball tournaments, would that alter your opinion of Rick Barnes? No. In using him this year? Stats? You're basically you're saying, will stats alter my opinion of, of his team? If, if his team fits those stats? Yes. No. I, I, what about I, looking I at if, if this is the best defensive Tennessee team that Rick Barnes has coached? No, no because again... What I'm looking at is 10 to 1. I don't mind if Rick Barnes's team is 20 to 1 or 30 to 1. Maybe I'll give him a break this year, that year, and I'll say, hey, you know, I like the team. He's had maybe the best defense he's ever had, but I can't do it at 10 to 1. I just, I just, first of all, I don't think there's any value with that anyway. Don't forget, um, one of the trends that will go over, and uh, and, and this, this is something that I think I'm not sure people understand or, or, or realize, but when you're talking about number one seeds since 1979, uh, and we're going to go over the number one seeds that have made the Final Four each tournament, you have uh, only one has made it 17 times, two has made it 18 times. So one or two has made it 35 times since 1979. Three number one seeds have only made it four times, and and four times, excuse me, and only once has four te- four number one seeds made it. That was two thousand eight. So what that's telling you is, is almost every year two number one seeds are not making it to the final four. So that's why I think it's hard enough when you're trying to pick a, a favorite in 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 the uh, in the tournament each year, let alone trying to uh, pick a favorite that has a coach that just doesn't get things going to come tournament time. I, I agree with you, Greg. The price the price on Tennessee. Tennessee is a viable candidate to win it all. Barnes, you know, besides the point that he hasn't really done much in that area, but that price of ten to one is way too low. I wouldn't be surprised if that like, they could be the fourth number one seed, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's a little bit higher than 10 to one if they're a number two seed. Well, Tony, let me ask you this. I'm going to bring you in as the defense attorney for Rick Barnes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and he wants payment I, in advance. I'll, I'll say I, I probably wouldn't take that case on general. You, you wouldn't. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, my point in question is this, is if uh, Tennessee is the number one seed in the Southeast conference, tournament going in and they lose in the quarterfinals going out they are obviously not going to haul down a number one seat in the big tournament but what if they're a number four seat in the ncaa basketball tournament do you come to rick barnes's aid as a number four seat or do you say i told you so well if i'm his public defender i would go to the status quo of saying well his team's going to be fresher because they didn't play on the semifinals and the finals and they're going to be more focused because it's easier to get kids to focus after a loss. And uh, I go to all those old adages. Uh, but really, it's going to come down to matchups. And, and, and what, what I will say I agree with Greg on is a lot of his teams tend to lose because of the same reason. They run out of scoring punch. Uh, they, they, they have a, a poor offensive outing. Uh, I think that was the case last time out. I, they, they were in Orlando. I know that because uh, I went to, to the, the, the one game that they played uh, um, and it was a, a very a, a, like a clunker of a low scoring game. And it was typical Rick Barnes. And this particular team has Dalton Connect and they have a healthy Zakai Siegler, uh, who New York City point guard, um, finally over his knee injury because you know, he was a shell of himself, obviously got injured last season. So that was they were they had a strike against them going in. 
Uh, he got injured, I think it was in the SEC tournament. You can't win a, a tourney without their point guard. Uh, so now he's healthy. He started the season, and he it looked like a shell of himself. Now he looks like himself. So uh, that, that's why he talked about Kansas. Bill Self often did not mind losing in the semifinals of the Big 12 championship because he didn't want to play for a third or fourth straight day. He said, he, we've proven enough now. That may be different this year, but in the past, he knew he had a number one or two seed locked up. And he said, you know what? The loss won't hurt us. We're an experienced team. We'd rather have that extra day off before the big uh, tournament begins. Yeah, by yeah, the way, I, mean, I did, I did, lost, I did double year. check that, by the way, and I'll let you go, Tony, is that the fact that no team has ever lost their first conference a uh, tournament. tournament game and won the national championship. I'm, I'm talking about winning the conference championship isn't important. You know, in other words, you make it through oh, the sure. first two games yeah. and that's it. And uh, now I'm, I'm talking about Kansas conceding, in effect, the semifinal game so they didn't have to play a third or fourth straight day. Yeah, I mean, that's they don't, they don't really want a game or two. That disappoints Jayhawk Nation that makes that pilgrimage into Kansas City every year. But sure, look, I mean, last season I think they lost it to Texas. In the in the Big 12 championship, so once you're already there and playing on the, the third game in as many nights, you might as well win. But and that, that I, I remember losing a lot of money on that game because I, I had a hard time believing that uh, Rodney Terry was going to outcoach Self in Kansas City, and they blew him out. Go figure. Um, and Dylan Disu, who, who uh, got hurt this week with a knee thing, hopefully he's going to be good. Um, he had a fantastic game, and the Jayhawks just got beat. So, you know, we'll see. But, look, I mean, to your point, Andy, it's more difficult to win a, a conference tournament than an NCAA tournament because all the teams have scouted you all year. They know what you're coming to the table with. Whereas in, in the NCAA tournament, it's, you know, you, you, you got to get on the ball Sunday night after selection Sunday, Sunday night after you advance uh, in, in the second round, Sunday night after you advance, um, you know, uh, in the final so, or, or from, the, uh, from the Elite Eight. So, it's just basically that that tests your coaching acumen. Um, whereas in the in, in your conference tournament, everybody already has built-in profiles. So. Hey guys, uh, before we wrap things up and get over to our free picks for the week uh, this week, uh, one note in closing here is uh, I want to ask you guys what the sentiment might be about the Pac-12 tournament this year. We know it'll be the last year for the Pac-12 tournament. Uh, and it was, as it was for the football season and uh, college football, and the Pac-12 really performed admirably on the whole for most of the season here. In fact, in non-conference games, they were outstanding. Uh, would anybody on the panel here be surprised, other than Arizona, who is obviously going to be a number one seed, to see a Pac-12 team make it to the Final Four other than Arizona? Um, I'll, I'll start with that just because I, I have a crush on Colorado. Okay. Even though I do not like – I do not like what Tad Boyle has done with that team this year, uh, but they did ha they did face a lot of injuries, um, you know, earlier in the season. They they lost some god awful games, and I I went down with the ship on instances where he was clearly out coached. And I know that there it, 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 there are some Buffs fans that wouldn't mind to see him go. That said, they're going to be the number three seed. Cody Williams, who hasn't played the last few games and has had an injury riddled freshman season is going to be a top three pick in the NBA draft. His brother's doing really well. Jalen Williams is already a superstar as a, as a second banana for the Thunder behind Shea Gilgis Alexander. Uh, I mean, a, a tremendous amount of talent on that team. Tristan De Silva, senior. Uh, K.J. Simpson, senior guard. Um, you know, they've got glue guys. They, they, I mean, they can't, they can, the, the thing with Colorado is, can they win outside of Boulder? And even then, this season, they haven't proven that that's the case. But from a talent standpoint, Colorado can play with anybody in the country, and they're going to get in now after beating Oregon last night. They've got to survive Oregon State, who uh, took down Utah yesterday. And uh, seed-wise, they'll probably finish top six or seven. We'll see what they do in Las Vegas. Uh, beyond that, I don't think the Ducks make the tournament. I don't think the Utes make the tournament. Uh, so you're looking at Arizona, Washington State, and Colorado as potentially the, the only teams that make the NCAA tournament out of the Pac-12 this year. I'm going to take a look at Washington State because they were in a perfect – I lost with them last night. So this is not a gripe, but it was it supports why I looked at playing the Cougars last night. They started the uh, evening one game behind Arizona in the Pac-12 standings. Of course, Washington State was one of the teams, one of the two teams remaining, along with Oregon State, as the rest of the conference bolted elsewhere, including uh, Arizona. Washington State had an opportunity by winning 
the final game of the regular season last night against Washington, whom they beat by three points in a very competitive game when they played earlier at Washington, they needed Arizona to lose to either UCLA or USC. Now, they beat UCLA, uh, I think it was last night, and uh, they've got USC coming up, I believe, on Saturday. This Had they tied in the standings, Washington State had the tiebreaker because they beat Arizona twice this season, at home and at Arizona. So, and they'd been playing tremendous basketball, and uh, had they won last night, they would have been. They would have still needed help from Arizona. It uh, first of all it was a last home game, but more importantly, at least in the minds of certainly the alumni and perhaps even the team itself, Washington State had they been able to accomplish that, if they had been able to get the win and then have Arizona lose once, they would have won their first and what would have turned out to be the final Pac-12 championship since 1941. So you're talking over 80 years. That's oh. that. I thought would be a huge incentive for them to accomplish something that they hadn't accomplished since their great grandparents were going to games <laughs> and had the opportunity to close out and say, guys, see ya. We won the final game at the final Pac-12 championship. In any event, that's setting the stage for, I want to see how Washington state performed. They ended up losing the game outright. They were down basically wire to wire last night. I want to see how Washington state performs in the Pac-12 because I considered last night to be a key game, not almost a pressure game to the extent of the historical significance of it. They did not play well. I want to see if they can rebound from that in the Pac-12 championship and see if they can recover. If they end up going and win the Pac-12 championship, then I might consider Washington State as a team that can make some noise in the big tournament. If, however, they struggle, if they get eliminated, say, in the second game of the Pac-12 tournament, they're probably a go against in the big dance. When was the last time they won a, uh, a tournament championship? Do you know? I, I remember the last time. I think they said it was, what, 2008 or something that they tied for the regular season championship. No, I, I mean a conference, a, a postseason tournament. tournament. Yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I was, I was thinking about the regular season? tournament, yeah. Yeah, because that would be interesting because, you know, it could have been a long time for that as well. Not as long as the 1940s, but... By the way, they made the Final Four in 1941. Okay, yeah. And and look, that was also that's a rivalry. We yep. basketball, football, those Washington, Washington State matchups or rivalry games. Um I normally I would have normally I would have looked to take the points with Washington, but considering they were going up against their most bitter rival who bolted the conference and left them in the lurch, the yeah. historical significance sort of outweighed the fact that, yeah, I expected a competitive game, but with those other factors in place, Washington State, who had come from all basically out of nowhere over the second half of the season, and more importantly, the fact that they had beaten the best team in the conference twice, Arizona. Yeah, if they lose to Arizona in the championship game, I mean, you obviously just say, that's okay. You've already beaten him twice. You can't be expected to beat him three times. So um, I think uh, – and, and it'll be interesting. I, I hear what you're saying. If they lose early, that would concern me a little bit. But I think if they play, play in the championship game or the semis and lose to a good team – um, I think they'll be. I think they'll be okay. I think they'll still be a pretty good long shot play because they're a hundred to they, one right now. A hundred to they one. They are, but it would also be they'd be coming off two very disappointing losses in their two most important late season games. And you wonder how that carries over because we've seen teams enter the tournament who were good teams but had disappointing ends in not just necessarily conference championship games but down the stretch. And you know it's like hey, they just I won't say they packed it in, but they were facing a team that had. That that t the team that that was not playing well still had the target on their back by being a a, a high seed and you know, that makes the opponent's season even if they don't advance beyond that round. Hey guys, let's hop unless I'm unless I'm reading this wrong, just just to put a bow on it. They've never won a Pac-12 tournament. Oh, no! In, in, in 08 and 07, when they appeared in the NCAA tournament, they they fell in the second game under Tony Bennett in both both those seasons, but were had a strong enough regular seasons to be at large. And before that, they didn't make it. So. No, uh, they, they've been conference regular season champions of the Pac-12 in 1917 and 1941. There you go. So, 04. This is the perfect, that, there's your perfect way to send off, Andy. Well, Win the tournament. Yeah, put that in the Pac-12 yep. uh, capsule. Uh, <laughs> we don't want it to be known that we never won this That's tournament. That's it. There you exactly go. Because <laughs> what are they probably, what do you think they are, 3-1 to one to win the tournament, Tony? To win, the, uh, I mean, it's a two-seed? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, uh, Arizona's probably, right. probably 
but probably one, uh, uh, minus 200, minus 220. So, and they they probably, I mean, I would give them about the same shot as, as Oregon. I mean, as, uh, as Colorado, probably plus 350. Are you yeah, surprised? Remember, I, th- I think the fourth number one seed is up for grabs. It's generally considered going to be Connecticut, Houston, and Purdue. And it may very well come down to Arizona and Tennessee for that fourth number one seed. Are you surprised that James Madison is the favorite to win the conference tournament? Over Appy State? Uh, I mean, yeah. I, that in public wise, no. Not really. That's that that's Because you seem pretty confident that App State was gonna was gonna beat him a third time. Yeah, I mean I I guess we'll see. let me see what those odds are. Right now it's uh I think it was James Madison is plus one forty, App State is plus two hundred. So it's right there. Yeah. That's actually uh, not bad odds since App State's uh dominated the conference and they're getting two to one to win the conference tournament. Yeah, I, those are a fan duel, and I, I don't see any Pac-12 odds. Otherwise, I answer your Colorado question with some odds well, there. They, yeah, me... they probably won't put them up until after tomorrow when conference play is. Right, so when the they probably bet them on yeah. Sunday. Yep. Hey guys, we don't, have, any, we don't let's... have anything up here in Las Vegas, do we, Andy? No, not not. I haven't seen them for the conferences that are still playing right. tomorrow. Right. Hey Jim, speaking of which, uh, let's wrap up our, our show here with. Uh, the hometown state of two of our guys, Andy Esco, Jim Feist, the Mountain West Conference. And I know Andy had mentioned a little bit about UNLV and some stuff he wants to pass along here. Uh, this conference tournament, to me, uh, looks rather wide open. If you take a look, uh, you can have as many as one, two, three, four, five, seven teams with 20 wins in this conference if UNLV can find another win here. Uh, Jim, how do you feel about the Mountain West Conference here? I know they play the tournament in Las Vegas. Uh, is there a stickout team, or uh, what's your, going to be your plan of attack as far as the Mountain West Conference goes? Well, like, like I said, tonight I took Boise uh, plus eight and a half, only because I, I couldn't make the line as high as it, it got. And, and I, I realized San Diego State was undefeated at home. And, it's a very di- and, of course, I look back at what they did last year in the big dance and how good they were. Uh, you know, if New Mexico gets in, uh, you know, you're talking about teams that can really bring a lot of chaotic type play into the tournament. No, no I don't believe they, any of them could go very, very far. I doubt, doubt that, except maybe a San Diego State and the way they got there last year. But I, th- I think it's exciting. I'd love to see UNLV get in just for the good of the town, but we do have a very balanced Mountain West Conference this year that's really exciting to watch. Uh, it's it's just, uh, it's it's great basketball for this, this area and that level of basketball. So Andy, does having possibly seven 20 win teams in the same conference in a mid-major conference like the Mountain West diminish its chances of getting two teams in because nobody appears to be a clear cut stick out? Uh, I think it depends upon where a lot of these teams rank in those uh, net net ratings. And I think the conference teams, and you talked about, or Tony talked about them a little earlier, as far as some of the teams that have performed well in uh, in non conference uh, in non conference play. Uh, I I still can't see more than five teams making it into the conference, especially when you consider how some of the teams have been playing down the stretch. And you take a look at a team like UNLV, who has won, I think, 10 of their last 11 games, and they have a lot of close losses. They've avenged a number of their conference losses, of which I think they started like one and four in conference play. And uh, in fact, since December 16th, I think they've, uh, 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 or since, I'm sorry, since January 27th, they're 10 and one. And I'll throw it in there. I'm going to use UNLV as my best bet for the weekend uh, in Saturday's game up at uh, Reno. I'm expecting the line to be Reno by six to seven points. At least that's what the Ken Palm, Ken Palm and Bartorvik uh, sites suggest. So I'm going to guess there. I, you know, I look at a lot of UNLV's losses this year. They've been very competitive. Uh, they lost by two points at St. Mary's in the uh, pre-conference play. They have a nice win over Creighton. Uh, semi-neutral side. I, I consider really more, uh, basically a home side. It was not at the Thomas and Mac here, but it was in Las uh, in Las Vegas. 
they had uh, a one-point loss uh, to Utah State that they did not get to avenge. They did avenge the big loss to Air Force. So they've been able to, I think they swept New Mexico this season. Uh, so I like the Rebels, the way they're playing. I expect Nevada to, I'd love to see UNLV win, but I'm not going to uh, play them on the money line. I'm gonna, just going to take them plus the points. As I talked about earlier today and last week, that loss to Air Force may keep them out. I wouldn't keep them out, given the, especially if they beat Nevada on Saturday night. If they win that game outright, uh, they will have avenged a tough three-point loss that they had earlier to the season down here uh, to Nevada. So you're talking about a team that has shown throughout the conference season by, get, by avenging earlier season losses to the same team that they've been able to make adjustments. And by winning what would be 11 out of 12 games to end the season, I would think that they would be right up there. They Again, they, the last, last game the other night, they avenged the loss uh, to San Diego State, a team that's going to make the tournament and probably be decently seated. So I'm going to take the points with UNLV. I'll see what the committee does. Uh, it's going to be, again, one of those teams where if they get left out, there'll be reasons why they should have been left in. And if there were reasons why they do get selected, there will be decent reasons for why they should have been left out. So uh, I think the Rebels have played as well as any team in the country in their conference down the stretch. Let them make a difficult decision. Now, of course, the conference championship will be played here in Las Vegas. And I think anything short, I was going to say of winning the, the – uh, if they beat Reno – they, I'm going to say they'll need to make it to the championship game of the Mountain West. Uh, and uh, if they lose the championship game and they lose to one of those teams that's almost likely to make the tournament, like a Boise State or a Utah State, they may still have a chance. And again, it's going to depend upon what help, what happens in these other conferences that are uh, not likely to get multiple bids if some of those conference tournaments go to form and therefore open up additional uh, at-large bids for some of the high mid-major to a, to a major conference t uh, conferences. Let me throw this in here, Andy. I know our good friend Ken Thompson of SportsX Radio, we both do his show weekdays, and uh, uh, he had a, a guest on the show. Was it uh, not Ken Palm? He had... Uh, uh, no, it, it was Jerry Palm. I think we talked about Jerry that Palm. last okay. week. Who, yeah. he, who, play, who I think he indicated, we talked about last week, he says the committee does not count late season form these days as they did in the past and they also talked about those quad one wins which was part of my rant earlier the uh, quad one losses that they you know they talk about keep the unlv because of the, i'm sorry quad four losses okay but they don't talk about losses by quad one teams who play 13 games against quad one teams because of the conference they're in and go you know five and eight in those games yeah they've got five eight wins against quality teams They've also got eight losses. They've had more opportunities, and I think that that's something that the selection committee should review to level the playing field even more and make it possible for more of these quality mid-major teams that are playing well. And remember, we also talked about the fact that with the transfer portal, rosters now are totally overhauled for so many teams that it takes November and December for the coaches to get used to the new talent, and they may do so at the expense of stepping up in class. I'll tell you, one team I didn't get a chance to mention earlier, Grambling best team in the Southwest Athletic Conference this year. They played a very demanding early season schedule. They were going up against a number of you know, top 10, top 20 teams. They lost often by blowouts. It'll be interesting to see if they make it into the tournament. They're going to have to win the SWAC. They're not going to be an at-large team even if they lose. But it'll be interesting to see in the matchup what the lines maker does, and we'll get an idea to see how a team that gets blown out in their quad one games that they play and lose, how they fare point spread wise. They'll probably be a fairly big underdog. I'll be interested to see what the betting markets take a look at a, a, a grambling team that'll probably be a 16 seed, regardless of what happens in the SWAC tournament, how they do as a, a 24 to 28 point underdog. Uh, one quick question for Tony before we sign out with our complimentary plays, Tony. Uh, one of the angles that I like to look at when postseason tournament time comes is how teams have fared away from their home court. A lot of teams make hay at home, if you will, and uh, their home road dichotomies largely determines a, a major portion of their win-loss record. My question to you is this. UNLV owns the best record away from home of all the Mountain West Conference teams this year. Uh, but would you count them being, with the tournament being in Vegas, this being a game away from home, a tournament away from home for the running Rebels? Yeah, I mean, look, I, 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 I hear you, and that's, that's a great question. But I think that the, the fact that they've had such little success in the Mountain West tournament, despite the fact 
I, I, I just looked it up, so this is not off the top of my head, but outside of two, two years where they had it in, in Colorado, the Mountain West Tournament has been held uh, since its inception in 2000 at the Thomas and Mac every single year. And UNLV has won it three times. They won the 2001 tournament, and then when it returned from, from being played at the Pepsi Center at the time, now it's Ball Arena, uh, it, it, they, they won consecutive tournaments. I think it was 07, 08, 08, 09. Haven't won six. So from that standpoint, I think because it's Vegas, a lot of these teams' fans' bases travel and make it less of a, of a home court atmosphere for UNLV than, uh, than it normally otherwise would be. So I, I, I think from this, if UNLV is able to win the conference tournament, kudos to them. If they were even able to make the, uh, the final, I, I agree that they're going to have a great shot. Barring that, I don't see them getting in, even if they beat Nevada and Reno this weekend. Because right now they're 75th, and there are – well, the other teams, right now, net ranking-wise, in the Mountain West, you've got San Diego State, highest ranked at 19. We'll see what happens after the Boise game tonight. New Mexico is 25th. Uh, my best bet, I'll get to that at the end of the day, but it is, it is going to be on New Mexico and Utah State. Uh, then you've got Utah State at 32, Nevada at 33, Colorado State at 35. They, those teams win a game in the Mountain West tournament. I would say, you know, if we're talking clinching-wise, MLB, NBA, their magic number is one. Win one more game because you're going to have quality competition. Win one more game you're in, period. Mark, you bring up a good point, and that is how do you treat neutral site games such as UNLV uh, playing at uh, other than Thomas and Mac in their home city but not on their home court as a neutral site? But for handicapping purposes, I might look at it as a uh, – uh, as a home game because of the crowd that they might have if they're playing a team from out of town versus a true neutral site game for uh, both teams, say uh, teams from uh, Colorado and Utah playing a game in uh, uh, California or something like that. Uh, much like you have uh, uh, situations in the, uh, uh, in, the, in, in the ACC where you play a lot of games in the state of North Carolina, but not necessarily at the home courts of a Duke in North Carolina, a North Carolina state, and they're facing, say, a team like Boston College who is coming from outside the region. Well, that's a good question, Andy, and uh, I, I refer that to Victor King, uh, one of our co-hosts on the show who will be joining us back for the podcast here come football season. Uh, and Victor is in charge of our 4D database, and he enters uh, everything, all the information into the database. When it gets to be college basketball conference tournament time, we have a decision to make against or about teams like you just mentioned, UNLV playing games in Las Vegas. Is it a home court? Uh, you can take some of the Tennessee basketball teams, maybe even in particular, uh, uh, say, for instance, Vanderbilt, who plays in Nashville, but the game isn't on Vanderbilt's home court, but it's in Nashville. So how are you going to enter it into the database? And uh, we've elected just for the sake of simplicity to call those home games for those teams. It's just left up to us to be able to evaluate it on a, on a need-be basis once the games do arrive here. But I still do consider there to be an edge for Vegas with, the, with them uh, this hosting the Mountain West Conference Tournament. Not, maybe not as strong as at the Thomas and Mac, but I still think that there is an edge. Because I, I also track those games. I call them home neutral, which Pretty tells well. me it's being played at or like within within an hour's drive of campus when they're facing a team that's mile, you know, hundreds of miles away, for example. It's a home neutral game, meaning that there's a regional site, travel site, but it's not on their home court or even not necessarily in their home, you know, within five miles of their, their home. Well, that's, that's one question we had also in the Mid-American Conference that raised when uh, both Kent State and Akron, they're only 15 miles, 20 miles from Cleveland, and the conference tournament was held in Cleveland. So, you know, what are you calling that for those guys? Is it a, is it a neutral site or is it a home neutral site? So it just depends, I guess, upon uh, the glasses, the pair of glasses you wear and how you look at beauty. You know, uh, but we, we had to make a fine, final determining effort for the tournament, and in the case of Vegas, because it's being played in Vegas, we opted to call Vegas a home team. What you do with Kent and Akron when they play in Cleveland? Neutrals. Because it's both of them. See, now, that's, that's the answer I would come to. But if they were playing, say, Eastern Michigan in Cleveland, I, I would consider that more of a home game for Akron and Kent. Well, th then you're really driving down deep into home court values. And, uh, you know, you're determining whether or not there is a home court value there of any sort for Kent 
or Akron in a game like that because their fans are they're only a 20 minute ride away from the game. Yeah, no, I'm not talking when they play each other. I'm talking when they play a team from yes, like I'll, I'll from Michigan. It. Because then you're going to have, unless it's a tournament game like this week, you know, this coming week, that you're going to have probably 90 to 95 percent of either the Kent or the Akron fans in that game against Eastern, at Eastern Mich against Eastern Michigan in Cleveland, especially like if it's a Tuesday or a Wednesday night in February. Well, a Tuesday or a Wednesday night in February, uh, I don't think you're going to find <laughs> too many fans from either school traveling to Cleveland to watch them play. <laughs> Oh, it's only 15 minutes. Some, sometimes the traveling team, it's a, really a road a road team disadvantage rather than a home team advantage, it, depending on the situation they had to go, go to travel. Like if they had like a four-hour bus ride for guys that are six, eight to seven foot tall, uncomfortable, that's a, that's a disadvantage versus the team that's home. It's, a, it, it's kind of take away or add. You know, that's a, you bring up a very interesting point that I use in both basketball and football. Home field advantage. Well, let's say, and you can, you know, it's no longer the standard two to three points. Each team has a unique home field advantage depending upon, or home court advantage depending on how you compute it. But I've always taken half of the home field, of the home team's home field advantage and negative half of the road team's uh, home field advantage because a home field advantage or a home field advantage is also a road uh, disadvantage on the road. So in other words, I try to equate them. So if a team has a four point home advantage and uh, another team has a six point home advantage, I'll take uh, half of the six and half of the four and make it a five point advantage for the home team in that situation because the road team is at a disadvantage. Now that might not necessarily work with a team like USC and UCLA who are basically cross town rivals, but you're talking about 90% of the situations where there are distances between the two teams that uh, are not easily traversed. Okay, guys, it's that time of the show here now where we're going to close things off with our complimentary plays on the card. And I want to remind you once again that the whole podcast is being brought to you by our good friends at uwager.lv, where they feature 5% monthly rebates to customers. You want to take advantage of your 5% monthly rebate? Log on at uwager.lv or give them a call at 1-800-UWager. And once again, if you like what we're doing on the show here, please click the like button down below. Questions or comments, fill them out. We'll answer you. And also hit the subscribe button if you will. With that, let's go to our complimentary plays on the weekend basketball card this weekend. And we'll start it off with our producer, Greg De Palma. Greg, what catches your fancy on this weekend's basketball card? Well, actually, what I'm going to do is, um, and uh, I already played a, a parlay, but um, and I did it on the conference tournaments. So, um, Tell uh, us about it. What's, yeah, uh, well, I, I did Drake... App State and Gonzaga, a three-team parlay. Now, obviously, the Mount, the Missouri Valley has already started, but you could still get App State. As uh, Tony said, they're about two to one on the money line. Gonzaga is about minus one twenty. So mm -hmm. I, 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 so I still think that that's a pretty decent parlay to to um, to put just App State and Gonzaga together. So yeah, I like to do that at this time of year, especially uh, I, even though Gonzaga looks like they're a shoe in now. Fact is. You never, never know. So just go out there and win the tournament. And they understand that. And they're playing red hot right now. And I think they're a good bet to win that conference tournament. And I don't have to worry about them. Maybe they're one minus 130. I don't have to give anything on the on the, on the the money line, especially when I'm bringing in a two-to-one team at App State that uh, has beaten James Madison twice already this year. So um, that's that's uh, that's just keep those options open as well. Uh, doing not just a single wager on a conference tournament, but you can do some parlays on that as well. Very good. Uh, and, uh, I'm sorry, with that, uh, Andy, what are you looking at on the card this week from AI, from the logical approach? Well, I mentioned a little earlier that I was going to use uh, UNLV if they're getting between six, six points or more. I'm expecting the line to be plus six or seven. I I know it's, it's a bitter rivalry here in Nevada. Uh, UNLV dominated for many years when they were a national uh, uh, power team, and the uh, Reno has sort of taken over within the state as far as being the better team. And we've started to see things level out over the past couple of years with UNLV making up some ground. So talked about the importance and the fact that they've been able to play a lot of competitive games, especially in their losses. So I'm going to go with that one tomorrow night. But I'll throw in another one. I sort of talked about it, I think, uh, before we uh, started the recording. I'm going to look, and I don't do it very, very often, but I think there are certain situations 
And tonight's game between San Diego State and Boise State seems to be one of those because they're both looking for positioning to enhance their resume. San Diego State's not the top dog in the Mountain West Conference this year. In fact, I think they're sixth right now in the st- fifth, fifth right now, I believe, in the standings uh, with, I think, five conference losses. Or, no, they've got six. I'm sorry. Boise is one among a few teams with five losses. I'm going to actually do a little five-point teaser on those two teams. I'm going to tease San Diego State down. I'm going to tease Boise State up. They met earlier in the year, and it was a six-point game. And uh, these teams are – both of these teams have had solid programs over the last half decade, especially San Diego State. So I'm going to look for San Diego State probably somewhere around minus 2.5 to minus 3.5 and, and Boise uh, low, uh, plus low double digits and look for that to come in tonight in what I expect to be a tightly con- contested game because they're both juggling for position within the Mountain West for the tournament. Andy Isco going to tease the San Diego State-Boise game up and down in that basketball game. For his complimentary call, Jim Feist, what catches your well, fancy this weekend? We we have beaten up on on uh, uh, Tennessee coach. You know, he <laughs> can't win. He can't do anything. He can't do it right. Da, 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 da. Well, tomorrow he's going to play Kentucky. There you go. Oh, and he's a nine and a half point favorite at home against wow. Kentucky. Hmm, big number. Give me, give me a break. Give me a break there's i don't care how i know kentucky's defense is absolutely awful i know that but you're gonna have to score a lot of points in this game to stay with them because you're not shutting them down they're gonna score 90 or more points most likely i'm betting the game over 160 164 in that range and i'm gonna take the nine and a half points so i got two bets for you Kentucky plus nine and a half, and both games over. The one that's, you're gonna, there's gonna be a range, sixty to sixty-four. Once that's one sixty, one sixty-four, over. And what's so the what money you, line? Uh, the money line, but look, I can tell you that it's got to be close to three to one. Uh, let me see. I will tell you, ten, Kentucky's playing to avenge a 103-92 loss back at the beginning of February. So okay, another factor to support the underdog. Also supports the over. And the over. Uh, yeah. ten, Tennessee minus 430. Wow. Four to one. Mm. Like it. So what, so what you're saying here, Jim, is uh, you're saying that Rick Barnes will not have the mentality to put the harness on his basketball team and say, go out and run up and down the court with Kentucky. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm saying it's going to be a, a much closer game than nine and a half points. I'm not saying Rick is going to lose the game, but – that's a, that's too many points for a team you can't stop on the offensive side of the ball. And they're going to go up and down the floor. There's nobody going to – I mean, granted, we know the coaching issue. We know how many pros that Kentucky has on their team every year. It's always the same. Well, this is going to be a, a high-flying game. It's going to be a lot of fun. They're both, they're both going to the tournament. You know that. And um, – I look for a lot of points, and I look for the dog to cover the nine and a half. Jim Feist, Kentucky, plus the points in, get up and over the total for his complimentary play on the show this week. And Tony Mejia, you can reach Tony, a playbook expert. Just log on simply at pb.buzz, B-U-Z-Z, forward slash T-M, pb.buzz, forward slash T-M. It'll take you right to Tony's page. You can find out anything and everything that he's doing on the card that day. Tony, what do you like this weekend? Yeah, I mean, big card tomorrow. Obviously, you got games at every time segment. I, I try to, to separate them, give you, a, you know, three plays that I like at 12, that I like at two, that I like at four, that type of deal. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, an all access subscription is the best way to go, especially this time of year. Uh, and my free play is on the New Mexico Lobos hosting the Utah, uh, or visiting the Utah State Aggies, trying to play spoiler. Utah State obviously wants to celebrate. Uh, and uh, New Mexico beat Utah State in the in, in, at the pit the first time these teams met. So certainly a revenge factor in for Utah State. Uh, not sure what the spread is going to be, but I would imagine uh, Utah State's laying at least five at home, given that New Mexico has struggled away from Albuquerque, and Utah State's been an excellent home game uh, home team. And uh, you know they they're trying to get an outright Mountain West title. But I'm going to take the points with New Mexico. They need the they need the game a little more. They got uh, uh, two bad losses out of the way. The, the Boise State loss wasn't necessarily 
uh, a bad one because Boise is also a strong home team. But that Air Force loss at home put what has had been a, a brilliant season up in doubt. And, and guys like Jamal Mashburn Jr. and Jalen House stated how how much pressure there is in being New Mexico's home team and having been there all these years and whatnot. Uh, but they they broke through with a blowout win over uh, Fresno State team yesterday or two yeah it was yesterday or two nights ago I forget you know, games run together at this point in the season but they won by over 20 points really like the makeup of this team uh, Richard Pertino got uh, his his dad's uh, center out of Iona Nelly Jr. Joseph to help protect the rim they got Mustafa Amzel out of Dayton. Um, who uh, transferred in and, and he protected the rim for Dayton. Now he's he's in a platoon with Junior Joe uh, uh, and in that in that center of that defense. And then you've got Mashburn, Dent, Donovan Dent, a, a really talented playmaker, and House, who's the, the Mountain West's best defender. I mean, this team needs to make the postseason and they need to handle business either in Logan on Saturday or by winning one conference tournament game to el- eliminate all doubt. I think uh, they get the job done with an outright upset of Utah State, but I'll take the points. And currently, Ken Palm has that priced at Utah State minus three. Okay. Uh, and that, so, that, wow. that, that would be I really would disappointing the if they could not get to the tournament with that talent they have there. Absolutely. And, and, and at this point, I mean, they, they're, they're in position to do so. Everybody respects the Mountain West this season, dream season for that conference, and they're ranked 25th. I mean, they're not even one of the teams that are ranked in the outside the top 30. Um, so, and, and, and you know what's interesting about the Mountain West, Utah, uh, Nevada is kind of playing with house money against UNLV. Obviously, they want to win that game. And especially if New Mexico takes down Utah State, a share of the conference titles on the line. But for both teams. Yeah, for both teams, right. But currently, Nevada now gets a quad one win because UNLV has joined the top 75. So if they if they lose, UNLV's ranking obviously goes up, and it's a quad one loss. Doesn't hurt you as much. If they if they win, suddenly UNLV becomes a quad two win. Just funny how that works. And the other thing that supports again getting multiple team more than multiple teams in at the Mountain West, the ACC is down this year. The Big East is down this year. The Pac-12 is down yep. those years. They have to fill those at large berths, and the uh, the overall competition, the overall quality of the Mountain West justifies them. The Mountain West right now is like the Atlantic 10 has been for a number of years where you could have made a case for four or five teams in that conference if the other major conferences didn't have enough quality teams at the top. Why are we- no, you're absolutely right. And these, these teams that we're talking about, your New Mexico's, your Colorado State's, your Boise State's, I'll take them at a neutral side over your Wake Forest's yep. and, and, and your, uh, you know, all these teams in the, that, are, that are borderline teams in the ACC like Syracuse. Uh, there and, are the, and by the way, that's the Virginia. Virginia's down yeah. this year. That's the where the ro- that's where the road records come into play. When you get some of these sure. major conference middle seeded teams who are in the tournament because they were twenty five and three or twenty. I'm sorry, twenty five and uh, say nine, and uh, you know seven of those losses occurred uh, on the road, and that big record is because of their home record. Such a huge contrast. That's when you take a look at a lot of these mid-major teams that have uh, performed better on the road and are not as top-heavy with home wins. We, we well, haven't no. talked at all, at all about the Big East, and you just mentioned that the Big East is down. But we got Connecticut as the defending champs. They're going to be a number one seed. we got Creighton, who's damn good. And Marquette. We've got, we, we got Marquette. Marquette, who's playing without two of their best players, yeah. but now we'll come back healthy for this. And then you got St. John's and Villanova, and you got St. John's with Patino there, who can he can sting you at any time. And um, but, why, but, are we but, saying, why are we saying this 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 conference is so down? Mediocre. I, I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, look. I, I, don't, I don't think Patino was wrong in what he said after they blew that game to Seton Hall. Yeah. Uh, this is one of his least talented teams, and he, it's patchwork. He had to throw it together after taking the Johnny's job. It's a bunch of transfers. He talked about their lateral quickness. Not wrong. He talked about the, uh, the, the point guard that they got, which is one of his few freshman recruits, has really been a, a blessing down the stretch, both on, on both yeah. sides of the ball. Really talented defender and a right. playmaker. But I, I'll, I'll, I'll name you why. 
Providence lost Bryce Hopkins, their best player. They they got Devin Carter, who's a, a first round pick. But you're you're now playing without your best player. Seton Hall mediocre. Xavier mediocre. Butler mediocre. St. John's not as good as probably Patino would like them to be. That's five teams that. Eh, I'll, I'll so you got I'll so you got, team you got three teams to consider: Marquette, Creighton, and Connecticut. Yep. Those are locked, and everybody else, I, I can take or leave them. Uh, by the way, since we're next week, will be just a couple of days before Selection Sunday when we record it. So there'll be a lot. All the conference tournaments are underway by the time we talk next week. So, bef- uh, right now, give me a a sleeper team, just one from any of the conference tournaments to keep an eye on, and don't be telling me no second place team. <laughs> Sleeper team, fourth place, fifth place in their conference in the regular season. Maybe they're even on the bubble that you think could win their conference championship. And and it could be to get themselves into the tournament. It could not be. Just it's up to you. Andy, what do you got there, bud? Uh, I'm trying to think of a team. I, I mean, where do you, what would you consider? You know, I'm, I'm looking, Mark, at, at your projected uh, team. In fact, it's interesting. I just took a look at the one that you did that you have down there as your sleeper and it's a surprising team because they've been a good team but they're not listed amongst your projected final four so i'm going to go ahead and use the texas longhorns are they in in the big in the big 12 are they in the tournament the ncaa tournament yeah are they definitely in currently yes yeah okay because what are they considered like fourth or fifth in the odds to get into to win the to win the tournament yeah, they're. Uh, I think they're somewhere I'm between sure fourth and sixth. Probably more than that. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Okay. I mean, Texas. Yeah. Right. All right. I'll but, th- no, you know what? Let me change it. I'm going to take a team because I like their coach so much, and they've been disappointing all year. I don't think it'll happen, but if you want a nice size sleeper, Ole Miss with Chris Beard, their coach. There you go. Year. Like mm-hmm. it. Okay. Good job. Ole Miss. Good job. What What else you guys got, Jim? Do you got one? Yeah, I'll give you a Creighton. Come on now, get out of there with you with Creighton. <laughs> well, they're not going to win it. Take Creighton to win the na- the national championship. I like that. Yeah, pick. You know, I'm, ta- I'm talking about Creighton to win the, that the, the conference, league conference. Yeah, that's what two if to one, three to one. Okay, how about Greg? Mark Greg, Greg? The, the only, only third Tony, or fourth. Tony did a great job eliminating every other team. I only have two left. <laughs> yeah. Greg, the only third or fourth place team you can consider to be a long shot would be in the uh, West Coast. Other than uh, Gonzaga or uh, St. Oh, Mary's, yeah, yeah, the, t- the top two, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, it, do you guys give a, uh, San Francisco any chance at all? No. That's it, I, I. I give them a chance of winning one of those games. One, both of them. Yeah. Got to take both of them down. Yeah, that's tough. It's a good team, though. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah, they they probably, they well. I'll tell you what. If they were well, they obviously they get the automatic bid. But certainly, if they were to beat uh, St. Mary's uh, and uh, then the Gonzaga, or maybe it's the other way around. I think it's, it's the other way around. I think they would play uh, uh, Gonzaga first. They'd get at least that one quad A win. And uh, I think San Francisco themselves may be a quad one team. Tony, do you have a pick for us? I will. I will give you my. The, the, the teams that are on the cusp of, of who I'll, I'll, I'll go with, I'll, I'll go Wake Forest oh. in the ACC, Wake potentially. Forest. All right. In, in, the, uh, in the Big 12, nah, I don't really see a long shot, okay. a super long shot. Don't believe in TCU can win all those games. Same thing with BYU. Uh, and in the Big 10, I do believe Michigan State can win that tournament. And they're on the out, kind of on the outside looking in. But way out of left field, if Arizona happens to slip up, and I like Colorado a ton, but again, we'll, we'll see what happens. They're already in a bid stealer, USC. USC huh? has the talent to win that tournament and the Pac-12 outside of Arizona, really not that deep. So depending on what happens on, uh, on Saturday with uh, USC hosting uh, Arizona, we'll see how they play in that game. Uh, but you got Collier, who's a hell of a talent, Boogie Ellis in his final run. They've got some rim protectors. Uh, what happened Johnson, to them this year then? What happened to them this year? A lot of injuries. Okay. A lot of injuries, a lot of distractions. Collier was out for what, a month and a half? Oh, so, so are they uh, getting a, a, most of those players back? Yeah, Collier's back. I mean, they're whole now. Oh, okay. Whole. That's a good one, Ed. That kid, Iwatuku, who was supposed to be a lottery pick as a center and then had his art issue. You got Bronny to have his art issue. I don't know what they, they're putting the water at the Galen Center. Wow. But um, you know, that, that's a hell of a talented team. And right now they're. They're seven and twelve in conference, 
So, I mean, they're, they're going to have to win four games in four days. Uh, probably not going to happen, but I, I, one team that like That's a good one. UCLA, uh, USC, and yeah, you can't you can't say that I'm uh, I'm going with a Creighton like Jeff. <laughs> UCLA is one of the more disappointing teams in the country this year. Yeah, yeah they absolutely. Yeah, they I, and I really uh, Arkansas. Yeah, Arkansas too. Yeah, Musselman normally gets those transfers to to see it his way, and just never did. This. By this time of the year, absolutely. Uh, Mark. Well, I'm going to look at the. I concur with Michigan State as being a sleeper, as Andy said. Uh, it's a Tom Izzo team. I think that was Tony, right? Tony. No, Tony. Did you say Tony? Did you say Michigan State? He did. Yeah, I, mean, would be my I agree coach. with him, but he, he said yeah. it. He gets credit for it. Well, you got the head coach, obviously. That's the obvious. Remember, they were the number three preseason team in the country this year, and it's still Tom Izzo time of the year. I think he has to be considered the type of team that nobody's going to want to play in the Big Ten tournament. The other guy I might throw out there in the Atlanta Coast Conference might be Clemson. Uh, they're closing real well right now, playing their best basketball of the season, and they were really, really good away from little John Coliseum this year. They had 14 times away they won and covered nine of those basketball games. Which is, by the way, uncharacteristic of this year's Clemson team. Yes. To be performing yes. so well away from home. Exactly right. So, you know, you've got the Dukes in the North Carolina who figured to be in the finals, but uh, if somebody trips up one of those two and doesn't make it to the finals, and perhaps maybe Clemson knocks one of those two teams out, We'll carry the momentum with Clemson, so I'll call them for my upset. All right, there you go. So that means we've got, uh, let's see, we have uh, Ole Miss. Uh, we have Wake Forest, Clemson, Michigan State, USC. And uh, so, Jim, did you just kind of back out of that one and, and just after, after taking uh, Creighton? Well, see, see, here's the problem. Tony's 100% right. He eliminated half – more than half of the Well, league. you don't have to take the Big East. <laughs> but I was kind of stuck on, you know, doing some crazy stuff. So Mark Ketter, Creighton, to upset and win that, that tournament. Yeah. But, I okay. mean, beating UConn would be a, would be a, but, a but factor. But he's not wrong. Right. He right. he yeah, he St. Hall team. or St. John's is not unreasonable. <laughs> Unlikely, but not unreasonable. There Correct. you go. They're both, they're both solid teams. You know, by the way, guys, I had mentioned earlier on in the show – before we sign off here about those uh, elite eight elements where the teams who check all those boxes have won 20 of the last 22 tournaments. One of those losses came last year when Connecticut won the tournament and Connecticut was not one of those teams. Yep. Surprising. Yeah. But wasn't the last team Connecticut? Uh, and the team before that was Connecticut. Yeah. Yeah, so I, the, yeah, we talked about that last yeah. year. Yeah. Yeah. So the two teams <laughs> that have uh, awarded that have been uh, both times UConn. Yeah. Yeah. And they here, break they break the mold. Yes, yeah. they do. So and here they are heavily. So now, favored. now, and so in some years, it may have to be the elite eight plus UConn. Plus UConn. Yeah. <laughs> they get in and there by Boston. default. They'll yeah. get in there on their own this year, I'm sure. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll call good. it the elite eight and the Huskies. More like a movie title, Andy. Okay. And I guess we all have to pray for Rick Barnes because he has no chance. Bad news, Barnes, the latter day uh, <laughs> uh, incarnation. Okay, guys, that's going to put the wraps on this edition of Mark Lawrence Against the Spread. I'm going to thank our co-host, Andy Isco, from TheLogicalApproach.com, Jim Feist from Las Vegas, and Tony Mejia, playbook experts and sporting news, joining us on the show this week, our producer, Greg De Palma. Until next week, when we get deeper into the college basketball conference tournaments, once again, this is Mark Lawrence reminding you to always to remember to bet with your head, not over it, and good luck as always. <laughs>